mainly for the benefit of capturing public comments so that uh, we can refer to those later. So, but I did want to let everyone know that uh, uh, that we are doing that. Um, but we are doing a bit of a juggling act in that we have some folks here in person, we have some folks who have called in, and we have some folks that are joining by the computer. So uh, we appreciate your patience uh, with the technology ahead of time. Um, so we, we have both um, a mix of both presentation and community dialogue tonight. Um, we're, we tried to mix it up a little bit so that you're, uh, you're not going to fall asleep on us. Um, so I'll, I'm going to start out and then uh, introduce a couple of the other folks that are, that are going to give some presentations, um, and then we'll kind of go from there. Um, so let me see if the, you need to give controls on that to me, Jason. On the, uh, why it's not using the, uh, oh, maybe this isn't, okay. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Okay, well, no, we want to share this with the people that are on the, so we need, we actually need that. It is. Even now? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Now, can can uh, Steve and Christina? Can other folks? Can you can you still see the uh, the agenda slide on there on uh, on your? No, computers? I can't see the presentation anymore. Yeah. So I think we're going to have to. There we go. Yeah, it's either one. So you can see it now, right? Yes. Okay. All right. I think we might have this down. So in terms of what we're doing tonight, here's the agenda. Um, uh, just a few brief, brief introductions. Uh, we're going to give you a brief overview of what we're talking about in terms of the projects and really what's involved with this housing discussion. Um, and then it's six, about 6.10, and we might be a little off on our times there, but uh, we're going to have um, a few slides and some background from Tim Wood. Tim is with the FCS group and he is a consultant for the city of Grants Pass. Um, uh, FCS group uh, specializes in demographics and housing projections and they are a consulting firm um, up in the uh, Portland area. And then we're going to move on to the rent burden and discussion of uh, part of the evening and that's where we're going to um, have an opportunity for, for you um, both online and here in the room to give us some feedback um, on your perspectives on housing here in the city. Um, and then after that, uh, probably about 7.30, um, Elizabeth Decker, who is with Jet Planning, um, also a consultant uh, for the city, um, who is going to talk a little bit about middle housing. Um, and that's uh, middle housing is a term that's kind of referring to duplexes, triplexes, quads, and cottage housing. Um, and that's a kind of a type of housing that the city is looking at um, of integrating more into our codes. And then our goal, we will, we will not our goal, but we will commit to you definitely being done by eight o'clock. Uh, we understand if you have other commitments and you need to, to, to leave early, but um, that's the, we will definitely be done by then. Just a couple of logistical things. Um, one of the reasons we're here tonight is uh, because of the House Bill 4006. Uh, that is a bill that the Oregon State Legislature passed in, 20, 000, in, in 2018, um, which basically says if you're a city of at least 10,000 people and you have at least 25% of your households who are severely rent burdened, uh, then you are required to hold a community forum once a year. Um, and that is what we're doing. 
Um, as part of that, we are trying to log um, just those that are here so that we can demonstrate to the state that we've done our job. And uh, so one of those things is just to, to say who's here and kind of where you're from. So if you're in the room, we do have a sign-in sheet um, for others. Um, if you're willing to just type your name and uh, the street that you live on in the chat, um, that way we can, we can enter that for you later. Um, and then if you're calling in on your phone, um, if you could um, email uh, myself or Jason Mackey, um, who is also here tonight, and, uh, or call, the, call the, uh, the community development office if you need our email addresses. So that's kind of what we're doing. In terms of comments, um, in the, later on, we will have the microphone here in the room. Um, and then for others um, that are online, we're going to hear from uh, Steve uh, Faust, who is also with 3J Consulting. He's assisting us tonight with the technology and the comments. Um, I put post-meeting comments on there because uh, we, we will have an opportunity um, for those that, that couldn't submit something in writing to do so until Friday morning. So uh, you can sort of take some notes, and if you have other ideas, you can, you can send those to us. So So in terms of the, the project overview of, of the two uh, main things, the housing needs analysis and the middle housing code update, uh, this is just a quick snapshot to kind of give you a sense for, you know, really why the city of Grants Pass is here tonight. As I mentioned earlier, the, the House Bill 4006 um, is related to rent burden, but we are also in the process of doing a housing needs analysis, a buildable lands inventory, um, as well as a middle housing code update. Um, so as part of those those two items that are on the screen right now, um, one of the goals for tonight is to hear from you and to give you a sense from uh, the consultants about where we are with those, with those two projects. Um, the housing needs analysis is, is, is hopefully pretty straightforward. It's identifying the needed housing for the city of Grants Pass. Again, we're talking about just the city limits tonight. We're not talking about, um, I mean, the uh, urban growth boundary. We're not talking about unincorporated Josephine County, um, but the needed housing supply through 2040 um, and ensuring that we have a, at least a 20 year land supply that is adequate to meet all of the housing needs. Um, this uh, also involves compliance with House Bill 2003. Um, and then the middle housing code update, which will be a little closer to the end of tonight's conversation um, is really about barriers that might be in place right now, particularly barriers within our code um, that would prevent folks from developing those smaller type of units, you know, not necessarily your big apartment complexes and not single family dwellings, but kind of everything in between. Um, that's something that uh, we, we, we want to ensure that our code doesn't prevent people from doing it. Uh, so that project is to kind of help analyze that. And finally, as part of this introduction, the last part of my introduction is just to give you a little teaser um, with the discussion questions that we're gonna be asking you for your feedback on. So as you're listening to uh, the next few minutes, um, it'd be maybe thinking about what are some factors that contribute to rent burden in our community? Uh, what are some barriers to developing more rental housing? And what are some possible solutions here in Grants Pass that uh, that you may have in your own personal experience or you have in your in your own network? You know, that's really a goal for tonight is to kind of take the city beyond our inward focus um, on what we think about all the time. And, you know, in terms of administration, but um, and the codes and really hear from from uh, those uh, in the city who are living through this, whether you're a renter, whether you're a landlord. Um, you know, whether you have family members that are struggling with, with rent, whatever the situation may be. So maybe just keep some of those questions in mind. Um, and at, at this point, we're going to, uh, to move on to the next item on the agenda, and that's the housing needs projection. So this is 
uh, where Tim Wood, uh, one of the consultants working on, on, the, on the more data side, is going gonna, is gonna to kind of walk us through. So, um, Tim, I think if you, if you can request control, yeah. um, I think we can. Oh. I was just going to suggest I could say next slide because it's not that many. Um, OK, that's not that kind of cuts too. down on the on the potential for me to screw it up. So <laughs> anyway, hi, uh, my name is Tim Wood. Um, I am a consultant with FCS Group and uh, we'll be doing a lot of the demographic analysis and in particular the housing needs projection and uh, residential land needs analysis uh, a little bit later on in this process. Uh, so let's go to the next slide. And uh, the purpose of a lot of what I'm doing is to make sure that the city is compliant with the goal 10, uh, which is the housing goal of land use in the state of Oregon. Um, essentially, goal 10 is done every so often for cities uh, to make sure that the city is, is doing a good enough job of, of having adequate residential land to meet future need. So uh, that's the that's the main focus to make sure that there's enough land inside of the urban growth boundary to meet residential land needs. But of course, there's also other things that it gives the opportunity to touch base on and just kind of get a sense for what the market looks like now relative to the last time you did a housing needs analysis. So it's also a good opportunity to make sure that you're planning for a variety of housing types, uh, making sure that it's it, your code and, and your goals are compliant with what the market is producing and interested in now, uh, make sure that land use policy is up to date and compliant with state regulations. Um, and of course, it's an opportunity to talk about affordable housing in your community uh, from, from everyone's perspective. Um, so it, it's just a really good opportunity to check in on the housing environment in your city. Uh, so let's go to the next slide. And as I was saying earlier, <laughs> the the biggest goal here is to make sure that there's adequate residential land inside of the urban growth boundary. So this is the big text from state statute. It's making sure that we we get a sense for what's demand going to look like based on housing uh, and population growth projections going forward in the next 20 years. And then um, taking a look at what's buildable inside of your urban growth boundary that's also a zone for residential uses so that we can make sure that there is no point at which Grants Pass runs up against the urban growth boundary as an edge and uh, isn't able to construct any new housing because that would obviously be a massive issue. So let's go to the next slide. And again, we're talking about buildable land to accommodate the growth. And so that growth projection we're going to talk about in a little bit is, is just essentially taking a look at what the state expects Grants Pass to, to grow like and then converting that into housing units and we'll, we'll go through a lot of that methodology and you know again it, it's it's just a great opportunity for you to touch base with folks in the community make sure that housing is 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 moving forward appropriately and and that you're getting the needed housing types and that's something that elizabeth's going to talk about a lot later on uh just to give you a sense for probably what what's needed in the community moving forward um and also a good opportunity to check base on, on density and, and the like in the city. So um, just a really, again, good opportunity for, for the city to take an assessment of, of what the housing environment looks like. So let's move on to the next slide. So for my work, it's collecting a lot of data that makes sure that we, we know what the housing environment in Grants Pass looks like right now, and this is the first check that I always make when I'm doing this analysis, which is what what sorts of houses are we talking about? So as you can see in this chart, 67% of your housing stock right now is in single family detached, which is about standard across the state. 17% uh, in townhomes and plexes is a little higher than I'm accustomed to seeing, but uh, that's a good thing because uh, that's a really good solid middle housing stock that that's typically affordable and, and really nice looking. And then there with 11%, that's multifamily, so your traditional apartments, uh, five units and up, and then mobile home and other uh, rounds out that, that final 6%. So that's the way that housing looks today in Grants Pass. Let's take a look at the next slide. And then among those housing types, 
we often take a look at what ownership looks like. So on this chart, you can see the dark blue bar that, that makes up the bottom half of these bars is owner occupied. So as you can see with single family, that's predominantly owner occupied. That makes sense. Um, and but there's a, there's a significant chunk of renter occupied housing units in Grants Pass. Uh, pretty interesting development there. And then among the townhomes and plexes, even less owner occupied uh, residential units in that category. And then among multifamily, practically no owner occupied. Um, and then among mobile home and other, it's about two thirds owner occupied for mobile homes, which again, that's that's pretty standard across the state. So um, this. This looks about right, and I hope that it looks about right to you too. Uh, let's take a look at the next slide. And so this is a look at what the the housing development picture looks like in Grants Pass over the last few years. So what's changed and, and what is the market bearing these days? So as you can see in this one again, that dark blue bar is going to be single family. So predominantly single family development, although a pretty significant uptick over the 2017 to 2020 timeframe in plexus and multifamily. So that's any units above two and up uh, as, as one unit. And then um, manufactured homes, you've had sort of sporadic fits and starts uh, between 2017 and 2020. Um, so that's a good solid variety that we're seeing developed in in Grants Pass, uh, even among the other cities that I'm working in. That's, that's a pretty healthy mix already, which is really encouraging to see. Let's take a look at the next slide. And so for that calculation that we were talking about earlier, figuring out what the growth looks like in the city over the next 20 years, what, what growth do we have to accommodate for as we move forward? And so this chart shows you Josephine County growth projections and Grants Pass UGB growth projections. Um, these growth projections are done by Portland State University's Population Research Center, and this is the state's trusted source. And this is this is the one element of this calculation that there's just no changing. So uh, as you can see, we're looking at uh, pretty significant growth in the Grants Pass urban growth boundary, just a little under 10,000. So that's that's pretty significant. So we got to make sure that we're able to accommodate within the Grants Pass Urban Growth Boundary, those new residents. And that's a big part of what I'm getting to calculate uh, in this project, which is a lot of fun. So let's take a look at the next slide. And another element that's really important is to consider the group quarters population in that, because that's a very unique uh, set of housing units. Those are congregate care facilities or dormitories or uh, institutions like prisons, that kind of thing. So you can see that grants passes sort of ebbed and flowed uh, between 2000 and 2018, which is what we're looking at here. Um, and this is mainly used to make sure that we're accounting for that as a housing type. So as that population grows, how much of that population is going to or, or do we expect to be accommodated in, in group quarters? Because that typically doesn't come out of the residential land supply. Let's take a look at the next slide. OK, <laughs> so what do what do housing units look like in Grants Pass? How big are they? And as you can see here, they've been pretty steady from 2000 to 2018. Um, ticking up a little bit in, in the latest year of data to 2.39 people per housing unit, and that's it's about the same as Josephine County, a little higher, but that's to be expected uh, as, as we move into more urban areas. So let's go to the next slide. And this is where <laughs> this is where the calculation happens. So we've discussed a lot of these different elements in in the last little bit. So we have the urban growth population, uh, the urban growth boundary population growing by 9,401. Uh, we discussed that from Portland State University's Population Research Center. And then we take out an allocation for that group quarters population, which is about 2.7% of the current population. So that's 252 people that we don't have to worry about housing and residential land. So that leaves us with 9,149 people. And uh, by the way, I'm referring to the far right column. Sorry if that's confusing. Um, so the population and households that we have to accommodate, that's 9,149. 
at an average household size of 2.39, that's 382, or sorry, 3,828 new households that we have to accommodate inside of the uh, Grants Pass Urban Growth Boundary. Um, we also add in a seasonal and, and vacant housing percentage. So that's 5.6% among uh, Grants Pass's uh, housing stock. So that's an extra 227 housing units that we have to accommodate for a total of 4,055 over the next 20 years. Um, let's see what the next slide is. Right, so what does that look like? Uh, going all the way back to the first slide that we were looking at, what did housing look like between owner occupied, renter occupied, and, and what was the division there? So you can see that among owner occupied, that's about 44% of the housing stock in total, renters 50. And then among vacant units, that's 5.6. So that's that's generally the mix. And then you can see below those uh, columns, they're divided out by single family detached, townhomes, plexes, multifamily, and manufactured and other. And so you can see how those break out between owner, renter, and vacant. So you still have most of your housing stock at 61.4% uh, expected to be in single family detached. So that's that's right about the same percentage that you have right now. A slight uptick, uh, we're projecting in townhomes and plexes and multifamily, and then maybe a slight downtick there in, in manufacturing and others. So um, looking to build about 2,500 single family detached units, about 750 townhomes and plexes, 550 multifamily units, and 250. Uh, manufactured and other units, uh, along with that group quarters population of 227. So that's the housing needs projection. So this element of the analysis will is one of the first three that we use in the housing needs analysis. So this just shows us what does that growth look like going forward. Steve's firm's working on your supply side. So this is the demand side. Think about it like that, supply side and demand side. This is the demand side. Steve's firm is working on the supply side about uh, what is what is residential land growth or, or availability look like, and uh, so we'll we'll fuse those two in the next few months, and we'll we'll come up with a with a good idea of, of how it's looking over there in Grants Pass uh, from a housing needs perspective. So we're looking forward to continuing this analysis and uh, really happy to get the opportunity to share this data with you today. And I think I've got another slide in here as well. Um, and this, yeah, so this this deals particularly with the general topic of discussion tonight, which is housing affordability and rent burden. And as you can see in, in this table, um, we're, we're kind of dividing it out by income ranges um, to get a sense for what does affordable housing look like for the population of, of Grants Pass. And so our analysis is showing us that you've got gaps on both ends of your market. So as you would expect on the lower end, those two or three final uh, rows there, the less than $2,000 of income and zero to negative income, you've got big gap there uh, of about 1,300 units where you need about 1,300 units to, to backfill that gap so that there are housing units that are affordable for folks that are making that kind of money. But then interestingly, on the upper end, um, those folks making about fifty to seventy-five thousand plus dollars a year, there, there's seven hundred and twenty units of a gap where those folks could be spending more uh, that we would expect them to spend more um, on housing in, in Grants Pass, and, and we're we're not seeing that, and that's likely being taken out of that middle housing element to folks, uh, which would be affordable for folks making about fifty thousand to to $20,000. So it's just a really interesting analysis for us to consider going forward. And it's, uh, you know, especially when we talk about policy recommendations and the like going forward, it's uh, it's definitely uh, a, a really important consideration to keep to keep front of mind. And I think that that does it for me. So um, if there are any questions, feel free to throw them in the chat or um, I guess, Brad, is it is, is it time for me to take questions? Um, I think we're going to go back to Brad here. Like you said, if there are questions, they can go into the chat. 
<clears throat> we're going to move into the rent burden discussion right uh, presentation, right, Brad? Yes, Steve, and for those, uh, that's Steve Faust that's speaking right there, and uh, sorry the video is not uh, projecting to here in the room, but Steve, was there anything that we missed in terms of the um, public engagement part and how people um, gauge at the beginning? Did I miss anything that you want to add at this point? At this point? Uh, no, I think that's right, and we'll talk about this later, but um, if there are any clarifying questions, we'll take them in the chat, but the real opportunity and where we really need some uh, participation is after the rent burden uh, community uh, presentation. And then uh, we'll hear the presentation on mineral housing. And at the end of the presentation, we'll be posting, <clears throat> excuse me, a link for people to take an online survey about middle housing. And then I know that you, Brad, and the city will be publicizing that um, online survey through other methods as well. Yes, yes we will. And we'll. We'll touch on that again near the end for folks. Okay, great. Uh, thanks, Tim. So, yeah, we're just, we got, um, I don't know, maybe about uh, another 12 minutes or so. If you could just hang on with us, we're going to kind of frame this rent burden section, which is uh, really one of the main focuses tonight. Um, so, I've already mentioned this. This is uh, the legislation that was passed in 2018. Um, called House Bill 4006, um, which uh, requires cities that are uh, experiencing severe rent burden to, to address the various elements. And this is one of the things that first bullet hosts an annual public meeting. Uh, that's what we're doing here. And then uh, reporting uh, the agenda of the attendees. Um, uh, we're going to have a survey that's going to be going out. Um, so yes, we have... Yes, we'll be getting to that. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> so why are we here? Um, hopefully that's been clarified already, but the bullets at the bottom of this slide um, really are the three key things. The causes of severe rent burdens, uh, the barriers to reducing that rent burden, and then some possible solutions. Um, so to your question, <laughs> what what is rent burden? So we have we have two different categories that we're talking about tonight. One is just rent burden. The other is severe rent burden. Um, rent burden uh, itself is if a household, and again we're talking about household, so that could be one, that could be five, um, where they spend more than thirty percent of that household income on gross rent for housing. Severe rent burden is, is where that household spends more than 50% um, of their household income on, on gross rent. Um, and Tim talked both about ownership and rental housing. Um, again, the focus of what we're talking about really here is just the rental piece of that. So this kind of builds a little bit on what Tim showed earlier, just showing kind of a median family income um, of 50,000 or a household. This is what uh, we have for the most recent numbers, which are about two years old. Um, so these are, these are the figures for the city of Grants Pass through the U.S. Census. Um, the bottom left, just kind of, you know, uh, kind of a rough ballpark, about 37,344 or if you have a social services um, type of job or, or income, that's kind of a, a median um, for the city of Grants Pass. So if you take that, um, and then on the right, if you have a median family making $50,038, you divide that by 12 months, times that by 30%, and you come up with $1,250.95 per month. Um, that would be the number that we're talking about that is that is the 30 percent um and then we have a median household um of uh 42,142 and then the kind of a similar figure so um this is a little bit more granular on those numbers just saying in, in josephine county our mean uh, renter wage is eleven dollars and 22 cents um, so the hourly wage needed to afford a two bedroom apartment, um, $15 and 29 cents. So, uh, this kind of is where it kind of rubber meets the road in terms of uh, being able to afford, 
so we have 60 hours a week at minimum wage is needed. Basically, uh, that's a, again a rough estimate. And if you have some other types of income coming into your household, maybe that's through dividends or through Social Security or whatever it might be, you know that that also gets thrown into the overall. But if you're if you're just talking about minimum wage, you know probably about 60 hours in order to afford what in grants pass would be a median rent. Brad, this is yes. Steve. We have a comment in the chat function asking for a definition of gross rent. So, yeah, yeah um, so I, I have some, and maybe Tim um, wants to, to chime in on that. Um, if you if you have anything on, on that, Tim, I, I can kind of give the high level, but um, really what we're talking about on that is, is uh, you know, not including utilities. Um, that's that's really what you know what we're talking about. Um, yeah, just just housing cost rent, uh, housing cost expenses for renters. Yep. So how do how does Grants Pass look in terms of the rest of our region? Um, you know, we're we're right amongst the the, the most challenged. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Um, Ashland has. Uh, the exact same rent burden that we do, 33.6% of the population in Ashland uh, also has a rent burden issue. Obviously, you see on the family median income there on that second column, um, quite a bit more than Grants Pass, uh, 81,911, but because their rents are also about $400 more, um, they have the same percentage of population that is rent burden. Um, and then we have others there. I won't go into all those, but you can see Grants Pass in the bottom there with that family median income of 50,000, median rent 1565, um, and our percentage of severe rent burden 33.6. Central points coming in pretty sweet in there at 16.6. Uh, uh, you may ask why. Um, I can't tell you all the reasons, although I think one of the main ones, uh, they have much more flat land than Grants Pass, much more open land um, they also have um, had a, a surge in in, uh, in development and they have access to a little bit more of a, of a job market um, that pays a little higher wages than what we're experiencing here this is just another way to look at some of this data um, the left column showing owner occupied and the next one that is renter occupied so we have about 18,600 people in the owner occupied, that's 53% of our population, 17,000 persons um, and 47% uh, in renters. So this is just kind of showing that breakdown there. Um, Um, was that referring to Tim's? Yeah. So, yeah. So I think that slide that Tim was talking about was projected. And for those on the phone who can't hear the question, and we'll have to have you, Brian, come up to the microphone for questions. So, um, um, Tim, clarify it for me. But the, the slide that showed 50% was the projected ratio in housing for owner and rent. What this Precisely. is showing, and what this is showing is is current. Correct. Yeah. Yeah, hard data, hard data you're showing right now. So, yeah, this this data here comes from the uh, uh, Census Bureau's 2013 to 2017 American Community Survey, which is a. A, a, a rolling five year kind of estimate, um, so this is, you know, reported information. Granted, it's uh, three years old, but. Um, so I think the point here being on the projected we are we're projecting a bit of an increase in the number of renters. So household rent burden. Um, so we have 6,088 of 97 household, 9,700 households renting that are rent burden. Um, this is just showing how we come up with that 62% number that I shared earlier that uh, grants pass renter households being rent burden. Um, the next couple of slides are just going to 
kind of show you the by census tract in the city of Grants Pass um, where the breakdown of the of the rent is happening. So, um, so the dark orange um, are areas where we have 76 to 100 percent of uh, of people of households in that census tract um, or block, I should say. I'm sorry. I think I said tract. Um, have are spending over 30 percent of their income to rent. Um, so you can see we have a few here on, in the, on the north side of the river. Um, again, I'm just kind of focusing on the, 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 the tracks, uh, the blocks that are above 76% of the households. So we have one, two, three, four of those on the north side of the river. And then there's, there's two on the south side of the river um, that have, are experiencing that, that particularly high numbers. Um, all of these, uh, anything really, you know, over that 50%, that orange number kind of shows that, you know, you have a lot of people that are uh, above 30% of their household income paying rent. And this one shows where 50% um, of income is going to rent. Um, again, the darker orange kind of rust color uh, showing the highest, and uh, there is one census block in the city um, and that is just on the south side of the river there, uh, kind of on the west, west, southwest part of town um, where we have the highest number. Um, but again, it's kind of uh, scattered around. So that's kind of the, for city, the kind of the high level. Um, what we're gonna do now is just talk a little bit more about the causes and consequences. And uh, Jason Mackey, who is an assistant planner here with the city is gonna kind of walk us through that. Thank you everybody for joining us. So some of the common causes of severe rent burden are um, the rent prices in Grants Pass versus the median income. Um, rent prices outpacing um, income. And similar to that, wage inflation not keeping pace with rent prices. Um, it's also been identified that we have a labor shortage, um, which adds some cost to construction. Um, lower vacancy rates combined with decreased number of rental units being built. Um, people 55 and older living longer and more independently than prior generations. And just a couple um, points that were identified in a previous rent burden forum in 2019. Um, city fees were identified as a um, cause um, to rent burden and housing produced does not meet needed housing. For example, workforce, multifamily and affordable housing. So as you can see here from these two um, charts pretty clearly illustrates that the price the cost of rent is increasing at a faster rate than um, income over the past decade. So I'm going to skip through a couple slides here. I think Tim, you know, re really captured those during his presentation. Um, but as you can see here, what's being built right now. Um, the trend of development is not keeping pace with what our forecasted housing needs are. Um, and to be aligned with our comprehensive plan, 25% of new units being produced should be multifamily um, per the housing element of the comprehensive plan. So in 2018, Grants Pass contracted with Eco Northwest to conduct stakeholder engagement for a housing strategy. They held interviews, a public forum, and an online survey. And this I outreach identified barriers to developing low-income and middle-income housing. And some of those are um, land, zoning, and building codes, construction and development costs, housing, market, and financial barriers, political resistance and decreased state and federal funding. So multifaceted list of barriers. 
So Eco Northwest did identify strategies to address barriers to develop low income and middle income housing and public outreach generate, generated many recommendation, recommendations, some of which have already been implemented. And those recommendations were broken out into three main categories, uh, modify land use regulations, address financial barriers, and build relationships and partnerships. So some of the land use regulations um, where there's an opportunity to, to have some influence is identify land available for rezoning um, to a mix of higher density and for multi-unit development. Um, conduct a zoning code audit to identify restraints placed on multifamily development. For example, height and open space requirements. Uh, mandate maximum lot size, mandate a minimum density, increase allowable residential densities, permit the transfer development rights, um, a community land trust, and um, provide density bonuses. So addressing financial barriers, um, some of the areas of op opportunity here is to pass an affordable housing construction excise tax, what's called a CET, um, linkage fees for non-housing development, implement a community development block grant, provide fee waivers or grants to affordable housing projects provide city owned land to develop affordable housing and um, defer fee payments. And definitely an area of opportunity is for us to build better relationships and, and partnerships, um, increase outreach with the development community, work with other cities, jurisdictions and nonprofits and work with OHCS to obtain better access to funding. And just to highlight a couple of few examples of um, how we're working towards some of those solutions is we're currently continuing to implement the housing action plan. Um, we're in the process of multifamily residential and middle housing code amendments. We're also currently in the process of implementing the urban growth boundary rezoning project, which should bring quite a few um, more properties um, into city zoning, which should allow for um, more density. Um, we're, we're going to begin development of the Southeast Ramsey affordable housing project. And the housing needs analysis and buildable lands inventory will have a first draft um, for those two items, hopefully um, in July of 2021. So I think that transitions us into um, opening it up for some discussion. We have a, a couple questions here uh, that we posed at the beginning of the presentation. Steve, did you want to go ahead and take us from here? Sure. Thanks, Jason. And I'll just acknowledge that this is going to be a, a little bit tricky <clears throat> because we have some folks on the phone who can't indicate that they want to make a comment um, and some folks uh, on their computers and some folks in person. So um, maybe let's start with uh, asking if there are any questions from people in the room. Brad, why don't you go ahead and take it? And if there are any questions in the room, let's take those now. Sure, and I would just uh, reiterate this isn't really even so much questions. We're happy to do that, um, but it's also just you know your your own thoughts, ideas, and experiences that we want to hear. So, um, yeah, uh, and we can come back if somebody isn't ready. But if you are and you have some thoughts, uh, please feel free to step in so everybody can hear you. We would ask that you walk up to the microphone here and and uh, just uh, kind of give us your thoughts. So, is there anybody here that? Brad. Yeah. Yes. Brad, did you did you want to? I mean, I was thinking of going through the questions one by one, but if we want to just take them as a whole and say, here are the questions we're posing, and then people we can do that too, and just say, 
Uh, we'll start with the people in the room if they have questions or if they have some thoughts on one of those three questions. Let's hear those now. OK. Then next we'll move to folks on their computers and on the phone. So my name is Elena. Uh, I would like to know what the city is doing to create pathways to home ownership for low income citizens who don't want to waste money renting. Because I don't know if you've noticed, but the rent is really high and you can put that money towards a mortgage, uh, but that doesn't seem to be easily accessible. Great. I don't know, uh, Brad or Jason, um, if you have, you know, I can't see you. So if you have answers to these questions, but if not, these are certainly issues that we can uh, can note. Can record our recording. Yes, no, thank you for that. And that's a very good point. Um, um, to date, uh, I, I'm not aware of really any efforts on behalf of the of the city to kind of address that specific issue of trying to, you know, help, especially first time home buyers. Um, you know, that's often addressed more at the, you know, either kind of at the federal or state level. Um, it's been my experience than at the, uh, at the local. Um, but again, I mean, in, in terms of uh, addressing the specific challenges to rent, I mean, if one of those is to kind of, as you said, put that money um, towards a down payment, <laughs> Um, then you know that's uh, that's what what would maybe are the barriers to to keep that from happening, and um, oh, so yes, anybody else here in the room, Valerie? <laughs> I just want to go back to one of the slides. There's a couple of things. OHCS. I wanted to have that acronym because that oh. Was Thank you. Yes, we should probably never just throw up four letters out there. OHCS, Oregon Housing and Community Services. Um, so one of the departments uh, state uh, at the state level that is focused on housing, on, on rent, on uh, working with um, a lot of uh, funding for affordable housing. There was another thing on there that mentioned a, a linkage fee for non-housing. That was one something that was brought up as one of the solutions. It was right under the CET, which is a construction excise tax. And I, I linkage fees for non-housing development. I just I sure don't know what that is. So some communities have yeah have for for, for commercial development or industrial development. Um, uh, having some type of of be that would contribute to the to addressing you know the housing needs for for the community to kind of with the linkage being you know the employees um, of those uh, employers um, that having a more direct connection of how that employer can contribute to you know the the housing stock addressing the the, the housing increasing the housing stock in the city so um, I think there's there's different ways to kind of structure those. Um, but I think that's kind of the, at the essence of, of what that's trying to do, you know, as compared to uh, the others, which are just more oriented towards housing developers. Um, this would be towards, uh, you know, commercial and industrial development. Uh, Yes, providing it at the time of development of, of say like a you know a new commercial building having some sort of fee that would contribute to uh, contribute to you know the uh, ability to increase the housing stock. Um, and Doug just walked up to the microphone and he's got some other thoughts. Um, yeah, I had a couple a couple things I wanted to add. Uh, more along the lines of, of suggestions than questions. Um, one would be, I, I think the city needs to put more effort and, and focus its effort or direct it towards increasing rental production. Um, there's quite a strong pattern of development in our community of single family detached uh, dwellings. And um, I believe from the slides you've shown and from the reality on the ground, we need more rentals apartments. 
Um, and so I think it just needs to be a stronger focus on those. We need to lean in and make those happen as much as possible. Um, I think another factor or, or another thing that we could try to find ways of helping is to make it easier for people to be in the trades. Um, there's not a lot we can do for state certifications for engineers, architects, those kinds of things. But if the city could find ways of making it easy for an architect to move into our area or a surveyor to move into our area and maybe not pay city fees for a few years if they stay here and work, um, that might be worthwhile. We certainly have a shortage of all of those. And the ones that are here do charge a lot. Um, and another thing I see, um, I know Brad, you and Jason, Valerie, and a few others here in the city um, are working towards finding housing solutions. But I think maybe all the city staff needs to, there needs to be a culture where the entire city staff is trying to find solutions to this. And everybody's leaning into this process and trying to find ways of making this better. Um, and not sure exactly how that happens, but but it feels like um, maybe some effort into the just the overall culture at the city, um, getting housing going. That's it. Thanks. Thanks, Doug. Brad, this is Steve. We're, we have some uh, you know uh, comments and questions building up here with folks online. Um, just, can you just keep me posted as to when you you know how many people we have left in the room to speak and when we'll be transitioning to some of our folks online and on their phones. Okay. Um, anyone else in the room? I don't see anyone jumping up at the moment. Um, so Steve, why don't you just go ahead? Okay. I'm gonna, I'll start by wa uh, walking through some of the comments presented in the chat, and then uh, we'll think of a way to engage uh, people on their phones um, so that they can provide their questions and comments. So. Um, I'm going to go back here, uh, Brad, and I think someone asked who was speaking. I'm not sure if that meant you, Brad. I can't remember if you introduced yourself at the beginning. Do you want to do that quickly? Oh, I did it as quickly as I could, so. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that somebody, this is Anita Savio, and I, I think they were asking who was, because I was typing something in the chat, but it wasn't identifying me by name. So. Okay. I think it might have been interesting to me, I'm not sure. So I think they were referring to Doug Walker. I think we've figured out here. Oh, OK. Uh, um, D Doug, Doug Walker is the chair of the city's housing advisory committee, and, and he's the one who, who just spoke right uh, just a minute ago. Okay. Brad, has the city or anyone else, um, there, there's been no mention of working with landlords. Um, has there, do you, are you aware of any efforts on the city's behalf or anyone else to engage landlords in this discussion specifically? Um, we have uh, a list of a, of a few that the city has received that, that have participated in prior community forums um, who have identified themselves as landlords, who we are maintaining an email list um, uh, and so they would have been on that email list from prior, but uh, other than that, no. Okay. So that I think probably could go into a suggestion, um, you know, um, that we, that the city or some, that that's part of, maybe part of a solution is starting to engage landlords in this discussion. Um, I'm just going to say first names so I don't botch last names. Uh, Susan says there are access quote unquote programs opportunities for first time home buyers to obtain funds towards down payments and then ca uh, capitalized home foundation funds. I think that might be in, t in response to the question about um, um, tools and ways to uh, for first time ho homeowners uh, that comment that was made early on. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, Anita says more units of middle housing may be one way to increase home ownership. Also, assistance with down payments. Got that? Yes. Okay. And, yeah, and to reiterate, anything that was typed into the chat is is uh, been recorded and is going to be put into the minutes for this for this uh, forum. Sure. Just wanted to see if you had any response. And now, for the folks on the phone, and and again, people on your computers. You know, you can raise your hand or enter comments or questions into the chat at any point. You can raise your hand if you want to speak. Um, in the meantime, I'm going to walk, <clears throat> excuse me, walk through uh, the phone numbers. I don't see all the numbers, but I see the last two digits. And I'm going to ask folks if they 
want to unmute themselves and provide a question or comment. So I'm going to start with the person with the phone number with the last digits zero zero. And, and just to mention that you can unmute yourself by pressing star six on your um, phone. Thank you, Jason. So phone number last two digits zero zero. Any questions or comments? You can unmute with star six. Give it a few seconds. All right, I'm going to move. Actually, I'll go ahead and unmute you and you can tell me if you have any question or comment and then I think I can do that. Oh, no, I can't. Um, OK, last two digits, zero, 05. Any questions or comments? Press star six to unmute yourself. OK. Uh, last two digits, so phone number two, four. Any questions or comments? OK, not hearing any. Again, Hello. oh, go ahead. Yep. Please introduce yourself. Yeah, William. Uh, we could hear you. Oh, you remuted yourself. Can you press star six and ask your question or provide your comment? This is phone number two. Yep, go ahead. Yeah, my, my, I have a couple of comments. Um, somewhere along the way, um, government needs to retract itself. Um, a good example that my poor wife sitting in that audience has heard me scream about is um, you're a landlord uh, or if you're a if I'm a landlord and own a rental, I can replace that hot water heater that's electrical on my own and spend three or four hundred dollars. But if I'm a property management company managing for somebody else, am I still on? Yep, continue. Sorry about that. If I'm a property manager company managing for somebody else because of rules and regulations, I have to hire a plumber. So now I'm spending $1,200 on that $400 water heater. So those things all add to the rent burden. And that's just a minor example of the many things that we have came down from the legal community in the, from the populated areas in the state of Oregon. So what happens is we face those same burdens in, in Josephine County. Uh, are in rural communities. Uh, Valerie and I own about 600 units in rural communities throughout Oregon, but we also manage for other people. And on our own units, we can hold costs down because we can do things because we own them, but because we also manage for people where we don't own them, their costs for doing the same thing is extraordinarily high. So somehow, Legally, it needs to to come into the factor to lower rents. Great, thank you. Was did you have anything else? Well, I have lots of issues to be honest with you, but. Uh, <laughs> well, I'll I'll uh, mention that I'll mention that if you know folks want to uh, go ahead and provide this, Brad. Do you want to quickly provide your email address to people in case they want to follow up after the meeting with comments? Yes, Bill. It's Bill at LovelaceDevelopment.com. Uh, you know, there, there's other issues as well. Uh, Any time that if, if, uh, they just passed a law in the state of Oregon that if you have an elevated building, now you have to do a weight test every five years. It's just an added requirement. Uh, you can't show me where somehow we've operated for 100 years with elevators. And this new test is going to be a ten or twelve thousand dollar cost. Great for the elevator mechanic, but not so great for the renter who's going to have to end up paying that bill. Yeah. Uh, there's just all kinds of examples like that that we keep adding to the regulations. Those regulations cause rent increases. Uh, when you guys put, when the city of Grants Pass puts the burden of uh, financing things via the water bill. Uh, rather than bond issues, 
uh, the renter has to pay the bill. Um, okay. So, so there's lots and lots of you, you don't want to get me started because I could talk for hours. Okay. Well, we'll follow up with you by by email or some other uh, method. But thank you for your comments. I just want to note You're that I see. Yeah. Thank you. I just want to note that I see there's a couple of hands raised and a comment in the chat. I'll get back to you as soon as I work through um, the other um, phone numbers here. Um, so next up is last two digits, 4-2. If you want to say, uh, provide a comment or question, hit star six and go ahead. Give it five seconds. Okay, sounds like uh, um, phone number four two is passing. Uh, phone number zero four. If you want to speak, hit star six and do so. Okay, and phone number one eight. If you want to ask a question or provide a comment, hit star six and go ahead and speak. OK, and as we move forward with this discussion, if if someone on the phone wants to speak, please go ahead and chime. Oh, there we go. Phone number one eight. Did you have something you wanted to share? I think you're unmuted. Yeah, no. Can you hear me? We can hear you. OK. I actually don't have any questions. <laughs> I thought my husband did. I'm sorry. Oh, that's a, it's me. Sorry. Sorry. That's quite all right. OK. If anyone on the phone has comments later on, please feel free to chime in. Um, Joseph in the chat room just mentioned in re reference to the, the comment earlier about uh, landlords, uh, clarified that uh, that comment meant working with landlords to reduce rent burdens and help with availability some type of incentives or tax credits or something of that nature. Um, so thanks for that clarification. With that, I'll ask Jennifer to go ahead and, and unmute yourself and um, share what you have for us. Hello, thank you, Steve. Um, I just wanted to reference uh, Mr. Mackey's slides um, regarding the partnerships. Um, I was just curious, are there any partners here tonight to discuss these issues with us? Um, I don't see anyone in the room who's um, standing up saying that. Maybe you could uh, just share a little bit more on that, uh, Jen. What what your thoughts thoughts are about like which partners maybe uh, we should be reaching out to more? Um, sure. Thanks. Um, thank you, Mr. Clark, uh, Director Clark. Uh, so I guess I was also just curious. Um, you know, who um, or what is the mechanism to develop those relationships, um, building them and cultivating those partnerships? Um, and then then the question that came out of that was, are any of them here tonight? So that was kind of what I was thinking. Sure, OK. Yeah, um, last year we, we did invite uh, um, uh, Josephine uh, Housing Council um, who shared a little bit about you know their work uh, through the project uh, Section 8 vouchers? Um, uh, we we uh, did that last year. They are certainly an important player here in the community in terms of rent. Um, you know, I mean, I think other communities have have had a little bit more um, proactive approach to working with you know, with housing authorities. Um, and we, I know there's been a lot of conversation with uh, council and others here in the community about, um, you know, ways to to partner with, with Jackson Housing Authority, who has done some work here as well as, as Josephine and sort of building on those relationships. Um, but then with the private sector and, you know, developers uh, and partners in terms of, especially what we're gonna talk about next, you know, with middle, with middle housing and, you know, what are ways that we can, um, you know, basically get out of the way, um, you know, so that some of these uh, people who have an interest in 
building one triplex or, you know, one fourplex, uh, you know, can do that. You know, I mean, I think that's, that's an important piece of this puzzle, at least to, to build up the supply um, on the supply side. But, um, you know, I think you raise a good point and, and uh, partnerships take a, a, a lot of time and energy to foster and develop and, and keep those going. Um, so I think, you know, some of that's going to come from council and their discussions and, and uh, you know, kind of helping direct uh, the, the city in terms of where maybe we can leverage those relationships better. Thanks, Brad. And Susan, you have your hand raised. I do, thank you. Um, you had noted um, earlier on one of the slides, CETs, and I'm curious on what the thoughts were on the CETs because uh, passing on excise taxes and so forth always come around to the ultimate buyer or renter in the end. So I'm just wondering if anybody had more concrete thoughts um, to that, what they were thinking, in other words. Would you be willing, Doug, to we have we have Doug here and he he's with the Housing Advisory Committee who has done some thinking on this over the last couple of years. Yeah, hi. So this is Doug Walker. Um, yeah. Regarding the construction excise tax, when the Housing Advisory Committee was created three and a half, four years ago, our first, first task by city council was to look into construction excise tax. And so we did some forums and did some outreach and talked to builders and people in the community. And after that, we came to the recommendation, this, the advisory committee's recommendation was, this, was for the city to implement some type of a construction excise tax. The council at the time uh, did not think that was a direction they wanted to go, so they chose not to. Um, but it was our recommendation that they do do so. Um, and then since that, uh, roughly three years ago, we haven't had any more further conversations on it. Okay, good to know, because that doesn't seem to work in other cities, but um, you're a builder, are you not, Mr. Walker? Yes, I am, yeah. And I and I would say, um, as far as doesn't work in other cities, actually the, the uh, research we did was that it actually has worked in the cities that have implemented it. Um, Bend uh, being the case in point, they've had it the longest, um, and their uh, their construction excise tax has been very effectively used to build low income housing in their area, and it's helped them to uh, uh, get over the hurdles of a housing crisis and housing shortages. Their housing market is not nearly as bad as ours, um, and uh, Ashland would be one you could say the same thing, and they've used it to get some things done. And Portland has in the recent past. Uh, begun to implement a construction excise tax and then begin to use that money uh, for low-income housing. Right, and those are areas in which housing is growing much quicker than in our area. Um, but I had another point I wanted to make to um, Senate Bill 608 in 2019, the Rent Control Act, um, which limited, this goes back to one of the comments that was made about the various costs of being a landlord or homeowner are then passed further down the chain. I mean, as far as a barrier to both sides of that equation, the um, landlord then has um, escalating costs that they're no, now capped at providing to the renter. And so we saw across the state almost a 30% decline in rental inventory when those, when homeowners, sorry, rental property owners sold those properties, many of them single family, to take advantage of the housing um, needs um, of owner occupants, but then that decreased the rental um, units available, which um, even in Salem, they realized that was a kind of a shot in the foot. They were so eager to get that passed, they didn't think of the long-term ramifications. Um, it is um, that is a significant factor that impacted our local rental inventory as well but that wasn't addressed there's not much you can do to change that they were supposed to put another couple changes into that um well amendments to that bill i have not seen any come up do you know if there's anything being worked on to um make that more palatable so that we're not constantly losing the rental housing? 
Are you aware of what I'm talking about? Uh, this is Valerie Lovelace, and I am actually a city councilor. And I'm just going to go back to the CET tax that you were talking about. Is mm -hmm. as being a city councilor, I can just say that you know our region and how difficult it is to pass any tax. Yes. And so we have um, a councilor who is a builder. And when we did have the forums, the local contractors were very against the CE tax, CET tax at the time. And so I think that's kind of what the council was led, led us to, to be hesitant to, to pass it. One of the things we did do is we are trying to build up a, take surplus land in the city and build a fund from which we can do SDC um, grants to help low income um, housing get built based upon having a chunk of money to use um, but that is what a CET tax, T tax does, is it builds up a lot of money, and yes, it is taxing homes, new built homes, putting that money in a fund so that then we can help incentivize other people to come in and build and get SDC grants. So we're, we're trying to do that, but the CET was not really palatable to our local builders, and that's why at that point it was not put through. Um, I will agree with you that some of the things that happen, like um, what you're talking about, most people don't understand how it, de a lot of the legislature, the things they've done to landowners has decentivized people from wanting to become um, renters. And I'm just hoping through the legislature this year, they did do, did come up with something to try to help landlords as well as just renters, um, because that is something that does need to be addressed. Uh, a lot of people think of the renters as the big people with all the big money that, you know, are Re reaping in all sorts of profits, but that is not the case. A lot of renter, I mean, a lot of landlords are small people who own just a few units here and there, and um, they that's kind of disincentivized those particular people from owning um, and renting. So I would agree with you that that's something that needs to move forward is try by trying to, and one of the things we're really trying to do is incentivize like duplex, triplex, because earlier the phone call was was from my husband who does have low income housing and things like elevator fees. I mean, those are, are extremely expensive, which makes it very difficult for multifamily housing of apartments. Anything that has sprinkling systems, anything that has elevators has extremely a lot of high costs and regulations with them. So by incentivizing triplexes, duplexes and smaller units that don't have those sorts of costs, I think is, is where I see um, and, and doing more, just trying to get more density. We've also done a lot of ADU work to where we can take larger lots and have those lots be used um, to put more housing on. So we're working on it. We are trying to do some things, but we're here to try to hear any ideas that you have to give to us. Amen. And I just want to compliment um, number one, your use of the word incentivize. This is key, I think, to anything we can come up with. And of course, I think there'll be lots of ideas. And then the ADU work the city's done, putting the plans out there that people can utilize. Um, I think that was a very good work and that still needs the word to be spread. But um, you've, I think the city's done a good job. And that, that's it for my comments for now. Thank you both. Yeah, and we'll be talking about uh, middle housing in just a little bit here. I've got two people with their hand raised, and uh, before I get to them, I want to note another comment in the chat, which says, I wonder if there are any nonprofit low-income housing developers that might have an interest in doing something in Grants Pass. Um, so just wanted to throw that out there. Next up is Joseph. Go ahead and unmute yourself. There you go. Hi, right, can you hear me? Yes. Um, I guess this is kind of an answer to that last question about low income places coming in. Um, I'm part of a, a landlord's association and I know personally 25 landlords who have sold a total of 37 units uh, in Grants Pass or in the process of selling them because of what the Oregon legislature has done. And the talk about people coming into this area to build rentals, nobody wants to manage them because they're terrified of what might come next. Um, the most recent thing the Senate passed is more restrictions. It's more, not less, it's more restrictions, and they're trying to add to that. The relief that they gave to landlords was except 80%, and I believe it says somewhere that build, you can't sue tenants that 
destroy the houses. If you accept the 80%, it, it's gotten to a point of ridiculous. Landlords were the only business in 2020 that was forced to give away their product for free. And my family is trying to keep our two bedrooms under $800. And just our land tax bill is over 8,000. That's two of our rentals for 10 months just to pay that. And it's getting harder and harder and harder and harder. And they've got more restrictions planned. It's not going to be easier on landlords. It's going to be harder. And it, like I said, if you look on these forums, the, the chat, the, the landlord's talking, nobody wants to come to Oregon right now because of what might come next. Thank you, Joseph. Certainly very important uh, issues to consider. All those comments we, we just heard, including yours. Uh, Jennifer? Hi, thank you, Steve. Um, I wanted to address number three possible solutions um, in one of the group discussion questions. So yep. um, it's my understanding that we in Grants Pass have um, a lodging tax and a lodging tax fund um, where, you know, a percentage of what is spent on the hotels and motels in this area um, are, are allocated to different programs and things like that. And I think, I mean, if you don't know, you should know that lots of people are living in how in hotels and motels. And so couldn't a portion of that lodging tax be allocated to fund some of the housing initiatives since the lack of housing is generating some of those funds to begin with? Brad, are you able to respond to that question? Uh, no, I, I, I I don't don't have any uh, any specific information so, on that. I mean, other than I know that there's a there is a program that the uh, state of Oregon has that uh, is active right now um, to assist uh, people who want to buy vacant hotels um, and uh, you know assist them through the process of converting those to where the rooms are made into dwelling units. Um, and I know there's. Um, two or three in Southern Oregon that have uh, 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 nonprofits that have been identified that can, you know, are working towards purchase of hotels, but I, I'm not aware of any in Grants Pass. Brad, I'm, I'm, I'm somewhat familiar with these um, taxes. Um, uh, so many places they're called uh, transient lodging taxes, TLT funds, <clears throat> I, and I'm not an expert, but I do know that there are uh, many restrictions on how counties use those funds, and I think they're mostly uh, pushed back into uh, tourism and attracting tourism. Um, so if that's the funds that Jennifer is referring to, I think I, I think by state law, there's some pretty um, clear restrictions on how those funds are used. Uh, but uh, that's some, so, go ahead. Uh, and I, I don't disagree with that point, Steve, but I know that I would say within the last few years, um, the city has changed some of its allocations. Um, so uh, I, I, I hear what you're saying, and I, I'm not I, I'm just asking as a possible solution that if we can take allocations that come out of hotel stays um, and pay for things like um, tourism promotion, um, maybe we can also pay for things like housing. Uh, definitely, and I think that's one of those uh, potential solutions that would fall under the legislative fixes, you know, in that bucket of possible solutions. Um, that's all I was trying to say, but I, I, it's certainly a valid, uh, valid potential solution to raise. Um, so uh, we have a comment um, in the chat from Susan, just um, mentioning that we we need to not demonize landlords. Um, you know, they're a key to providing housing. And we need to incentivize them um, and help them to cap those rents um, at a 30% of income formula in their rental policies. And so I think we all uh, acknowledge that landlords are an important part of the solution here. Um, Brad, do you have anyone else uh, in the room that wants to speak? Yeah, yes, we do. Go, ahead, go right ahead. My name is Janine. Um, I would like to actually comment on the idea that landlords not to demonize them, of course, they're all human beings, but um, we, we keep hearing this idea that people, landlords are selling their rental properties like it's a bad thing, and I don't think it is. I think we should look at that as a good thing, because that means people are owning homes instead of renting, which then reduces the rent burden. You can re for, refinance a mortgage and make your payments better. You can do that sort of thing, but if you're renting, 
you have no choice other than hoping you can find another rental in town, which is not easy. That's just a, a comment I think needs to be added is that people, landlords selling their rental properties that are single family dwellings is a good thing for the community. So not much money on that. Thank you. Uh, we got one more, Doug. Yeah, hi, Doug Walker again. I'll, I'll try to be brief. Um, somebody in, in on the phone system or the computers uh, mentioned public outreach and partnerships. Um, that is one of the ideas that the Housing Advisory Committee has been trying to move forward through council, um, but there's been a, a, a difficulty in, in putting resources towards that. I think it's a very important and effective way of um, getting some people to do more development in our area. And so I would say anybody out there, uh, please send your counselors a note that, that that's, an, that's uh, something that you find is important uh, as a solution for this sort of thing. And then the lodging tax idea that was just discussed. Um, there is some wiggle room within the city council and what they can do with the funds, depending on definitions and what the money goes gets used to used for. But there are some concepts there that the housing advisory committee is trying to move forward. But again, for the council to take money away from one thing, such as tourism and shift it to housing, they need um, people like yourselves out there to say this is a worthwhile use of those funds. Um, so thanks. Thanks. OK. Uh, Go yep. ahead, Brad. It doesn't look like we have anyone else here at the moment, so I think we're good in the in the room. OK, I just want to say um, give one more opportunity to folks on the phone. If they have any other comments to go ahead and unmute yourself and share your question or comment before we move on to the next part of our agenda. You press star six to unmute yourself. And I don't see any hands raised. So Brad, I think it is safe to move to the next part of uh, our agenda. And that would be uh, Elizabeth Decker from Jet Planning talking about middle housing. Okay, Elizabeth, do you want me to be your slide mover or do you want to take control? Uh, if you could do it, it would be great, Brad. All right. Just one less technological variable. <laughs> So, all right. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Elizabeth Decker. I am with Jet Planning, part of the consulting team um, up here in the Portland metro area. But I have had the good fortune of coming to Grants Pass um, both um, with this project and with um, some earlier work uh, that's ongoing about the UGB rezoning project. So um, I'm glad to continue my work with the city. Um, and I'm here tonight to talk to you um, about um, from my the core of my expertise is around zoning, particularly residential zoning. And so um, you've heard discussed tonight um, that part of the solution is to look at middle housing and look at some of our zoning code regulations um, and how we can create some new opportunities there to build some housing types um, that are missing in Grants Pass currently and are projected to be needed over the next 20 years. So next slide, please. Um, so as we've talked about tonight, you know, we want to just keep in mind that housing is, um, you know, a, a public and a private good. There are many people that are involved um, in trying to get housing to market um, and trying to make housing available. But we've certainly seen how housing is in a shortage in Grants Pass um, as well as across the state. Um, and we want to just keep connecting to how housing is about serving the residents of the state or residents of the city. Um, and that local government definitely has a role to play. As you've heard tonight, there's multiple ways in which the, gover um, the city government is engaged, um, both in analyzing the existing residential land, projecting out the future housing needs, um, a, a variety of financial and regulatory policies, and certainly the zoning code that we're going to talk about. Um, but it's ultimately built by the private sector and controlled by, you know, for the most part, private landlords. Um, so we want to be sure that we are you know, building in a certain set of, you know, quote unquote, fair rules and possibly some incentives that are going to help make it um, feasible to get it developed. Um, and very important that we maintain this housing and build that um, additional housing units that are needed to correct the current deficit, as well as the um, projected 20 year housing, um, housing needs for the community. So next, please. So as we talk about middle housing specifically, perfect. 
Um, mi middle housing is uh, an alternative to what we've seen most of the development. Um, we've seen a lot of single family detached as well as multifamily apartments being developed across the state and across the country. Um, and we talked a little about in the housing needs analysis that Grants Pass has actually done a better job in getting some of these um, two to four unit projects built, um, some of the plexes and some of the townhouses. Um, so there, there is a component of this already in Grants Pass's, how, Grants Pass's housing stock, um, but we're looking at how we can expand you know, this missing middle um, because those units can typically be smaller in scale and often less expensive. Um, you know, I'm not going to say they will be affordable. That comes with a lot of connotations about does it meet, you know, these rent burden discussions and, and most of this middle housing is going to be market driven. Um, so it's not going to have necessarily those regulatory um, caps on rent to make it affordable to various households at different income ranges. Um, but by virtue of it being smaller, it's just generally going to be less expensive. Um, both the units are smaller and the amount of land devoted to them. Um, so you've reduced the two main costs right there. Um, but, you know, there has been some of this in Grants Pass over the past 75 years, but generally across the state and across the country, um, a variety of factors, including zoning code barriers, um, has made this housing really limited. It's been missing for the past 75 years because it's been prohibited in most communities. Um, so go ahead. Um, and so the reason that we're looking at grants, looking at middle housing in Grants Pass um, is one, the HNA identified a need for all of these housing types going forward. Um, and the projection that we heard Tim talk about tonight is that um, we're looking to get 749 units of townhouses and flexes and that's going to make up about 18 to 20 percent of that new housing built in the next 20 years. Um, so we're looking to focus in on that portion of um, the housing supply over the next 20 years. You know, certainly middle housing is not a panacea. It does not provide all of the middle housing that the city or all of the housing that the city is going to need. Um, but it's an opportunity area where the city um, could really improve the zoning regulations and remove some barriers. Um, we're also prompted by changes at the state level. Um, you know, you've heard sort of the interplay tonight of some state regulations and, and um, another change that was passed in the 2019 legislative session was House Bill 2001 that requires all communities um, based on size to permit different middle housing types. And so grants pass um, is required as what's called a large city under the, under the bill, over 25,000 people. Um, is required to permit um, a full range of middle housing types throughout the city. So what that means for Grants Pass and for our work for middle housing is we're looking to permit duplexes on every lot where a single family detached dwelling is allowed. Um, apologize, this is another one of those four letter acronyms, um, but we're using SFDD, uh, I see it right in the comment feature, we're using SFDD just um, to save space on these slides to stand for single family detached dwelling which is to say, you know, sort of your typical uh, new home or existing home built um, for a single family. Um, and we're looking at providing some more alternatives there. So uh, duplexes, and then we're also looking at triplexes, quadplexes, townhouses, and cottage clusters um, in areas where single family detached dwellings are allowed. So that means that it maybe doesn't have to be every lot like duplexes have to be. Um, you can have slightly different minimum lot sizes for some of these other housing types, um, depending on what's appropriate. And there could also be some restrictions based on, um, you know, for example, if it's in a floodplain or if it's in an area with landslide hazards, um, in places where we want to be careful about how many people we're placing. Um, also, if there are infrastructure constraints on being able to serve those units. But Generally speaking, we're looking to permit this full range of housing types um, throughout the city in all the neighborhoods where single family detached dwellings are currently permitted. Next, please. Um, so these are the housing types that we're planning for. And when we start thinking about what duplexes, triplexes, quadplexes, townhouses, and cottage clusters, I've said that a few times, uh, it's a fun tongue twister for you. Um, when we start thinking about how to plan for those, we need to keep in mind that we're planning for both new construction um, in 
for example, in some of these areas within the urban growth boundary that will get brought into the city limits and have that new urban zoning applied. So there will be new construction. Um, but there are also our infill opportunities for additions and conversions of existing buildings. Um, and so along with that means that there are opportunities in both existing neighborhoods within Grants Pass as well as new neighborhoods um, to integrate these housing types. And there might be slightly different um, design issues and um, neighborhood issues that come up um, based on those factors. Okay, next. Um, and when we start thinking about where these new middle housing types will be introduced, um, you know, City of Grants Pass is pretty large. I've heard it described, um, the zoning map and the city boundaries as an angelfish. It's got sort of its mouth um, on the on the right hand of your screen. Um, uh, if you want, you know, you can see the fins and the tail, um, but all throughout the angelfish, um, we're looking at all of the sort of yellow areas, the various shades of yellow um, are all the residential zones. And that's where we are looking to permit and introduce these middle housing types. Um, and so, you know, it's a little hard to see with the resolution of this map, I apologize. Um, but the other way to think of it is anywhere this red, blue, or purple um, is, is not a residential area. So um, basically anything but those colors is where we'll be adding middle housing. And you can see it's all across the city. So this is gonna be pretty wide ranging impact or potential impact, shall we say, go ahead. A broad opportunity. Um, but at the same time, you know, the actual scale and pace of development is probably going to be pretty incremental is what we're expecting. Um, and so we've talked a little bit tonight about ADU development, that's accessory dwelling units, um, which are an opportunity to build a small secondary home uh, dwelling on the same lot as, you know, your existing single family dwelling. Um, and Grants Pass has been permitting those for, you know, about 20 years. Um, this is also something that's mandated at the state level. Um, and I would say Grants Pass has really, you know, progressive ADU rules on the books. Um, there's been some recent updates. Um, there's been uh, some references to the city website and the model plans that are available for ADUs. Um, and so, you know, Grants Pass has really been working on ADUs. I'd say been doing a much better job than many communities I'm working in. Um, but still has seen about, you know, an average of one ADU built per year, um, less than 20 permitted so far. So it's very much an incremental type of development. You know, other states have experimented and cities, Minneapolis um, made headlines recently, at least in the housing and zoning world by allowing triplexes on every lot. Um, and they saw, you know, a grand total of three um, triplex permits in the first year that the legislation um, permitted it. And so, you know, I think that just speaks to how humans respond to change and growth. Um, and so, you know, this will certainly be a slower rollout. And even if we look at the 749 units that, um, that we're talking about in Grants Pass, um, you know, if you divide that over a 20 year time frame, that's, you know, works out to about 37 per year. So it will be, you know, fairly incremental. Oregon overall has projected um, that about 3% of its new housing stock is gonna come from middle housing. Um, and so, you know, it sounds like that might be a little bit higher here in Grants Pass. But again, this is a 3% bump over existing. Grants Pass already has a fair bit um, of housing stock built into that, that Plex and townhouse category. Um, so, you know, the 3%, the I wouldn't compare that to the, to the 17 or 18% of the total housing stock um, that's already in that. So we're looking at about a 3% increase um, potentially from these middle housing types. Um, so, you know, relatively modest growth, but hopefully that will help fulfill a very specific um, need for housing in the Grants Pass area. When we start talking about zoning code, you know, I think we're well set up tonight having talked about all the various factors that influence housing and influence the cost of housing in particular. Um, but, you know, zoning code is not Superman. It is more like a member of the X-Men, right? There are many um, superheroes working together to address housing. Um, so there's a lot of factors, everything from building codes to system development charges, taxes, incentives, um, you know, uh, public works and engineering requirements for um, public improvements and infrastructure. And on the private side, there's questions about financing and banks and access to that. Um, 
as well as, you know, the preferences of consumers, you know, are people looking to live in a quadplex? Would they rather live in an apartment complex or, you know, or a single family detached dwelling? Of course, that's going to be influenced by costs, but um, just a lot of other factors. But we're starting with the zoning code um, as a way of opening up some opportunities um, and hoping that then we can, you know, see what else comes up and if there are changes needed um, to some of these other X-Men team members, um, then we will get to that as well. So next. Um, and as we work through this, you know, I think we, you know, there are certainly different city priorities that can be served through these code updates. And so part of what we'll be asking you in the online survey, um, and to the extent we have maybe have a couple minutes for, for comments after this, um, is that, you know, we'll be thinking about how we can write these code updates um, to prioritize various um, different city policies. Um, and these are not mutually exclusive, um, but they certainly, you know, some come more like, you know, a teeter-totter at the, um, have to be balanced against other priorities. So we'll be looking at provisions that allow more variety of housing types, an opportunity for more housing units overall, um, making those regulations more flexible um, so that they're easier to understand for people that might want to build some. Um, looking at development of less expensive housing, um, how we can support that through the code. Um, providing opportunities both for home ownership and rentals has been discussed tonight. And then talking about how we address compatibility within existing neighborhoods for some of those infill opportunities, um, particularly parking impacts. Okay, next please. Um, so as we get into, you know, some of the specifics of the zoning code and, you know, oh, no, you're great. Go to the, go to the next one if you would. Sorry about that. Um, what this, what this portion of the project is particularly focused on is changing the zoning code to permit these middle housing types. Um, so one issue that needs to be addressed for all of the middle housing types um, that we're dealing with is off street parking requirements. Um, and so, you know, as you probably know, the average neighborhood, some people are parking in their garages and their driveways, some people are parking on the street. So there's off street and on street parking. Um, and the state, um, cities can regulate how much off street parking is required um, by setting minimum parking requirements. And so generally, um, in some cases, uh, we've seen that really high parking minimums off street discourages the ability for middle housing to be built, um, makes it just infeasible to fit all that parking on a site. And so the state stepped in um, and as part of HB 2001 that um, requires cities to permit middle housing, they also set a cap on how much parking can be required um, by cities. That's not to say how much parking can be built. Um, you know, if a site, if a builder wants to go ahead and build more parking than that, they can, um, but cities cannot set a minimum above one space per unit for all these housing types that we're gonna talk about. Um, so if it's a duplex, the maximum that a city can require is two off-street parking spaces. Um, for townhouses, it's one space per unit. For, you know, if you have a quadplex, we're looking at four spaces per unit. And I'm sure you're all good with that, that kind of math. Um, so that's where we're at based on what the, what the state regulations are. Um, and that really helps support site development feasibility, reduce costs, um, providing off-street parking is a pretty big expense related to housing development and, you know, easily in the tens of thousands of dollars um, per space, depending on, you know, underlying land costs and some other factors. Um, the city does have an opportunity to further reduce parking um, if there is a local desire for that. Uh, we want to just acknowledge that this is going to be a change relative to current requirements. Um, but we're hoping that, you know, as it rolls out and as we see this more modest incremental pace of these housing types coming in, um, that there are opportunities to continue to review um, how parking is managed, how these regulations work at both the state level if needed and the local level. Um, because we're not quite, you know, to be perfectly honest about where our expertise lie, you know, it will be interesting to see how this influences site design going forward. Um, and you know what developers elect to provide. We've certainly heard a lot um, in some of our stakeholder interviews already about um, what, how many households in Grants Pass um, are really demanding more parking um, per unit. And so you know if that is really a priority for households, we would expect the market to provide that. 
Um, and we also just want to acknowledge that, you know, how this influences on street parking demand um, in individual neighborhoods will certainly vary depending on how much middle housing um, gets built on a given street or a given block. Um, but, you know, we can take a look at some other tools about managing on street parking or the city can um, if there are real concentrated impacts. Uh, so with that out of the way, let's move on um, to talk about, you know, what these actual housing types could look like um, with sort of a um, pretty universal parking approach for all of these. So duplexes um, are really the, the simplest of the bunch. We're essentially gonna regulate them exactly the same as single family detached dwellings. We're gonna make them a permitted use in all of the residential zones on all of the same lots um, at where residential uses are currently permitted. Those minimum lot sizes right now vary from 11,000 to 5,000 square feet, depending on the density. We're gonna apply the same dimensional standards in terms of height and setbacks. Um, and any design standards um, about the site or the facades of these dwellings that apply to single family detached can apply to duplexes, but we can't apply anything else to duplexes um, that's different. Um, and then one thing that we're looking at is allowing this new concept of a detached duplex, um, which is basically two smaller units on a single lot as well as um, an, a, a more traditional attached duplex. And so this might get clear. We've got some pictures coming up if you wanna start um, going through these. Um, you know, first of all, just to say, because you know, a lot of this middle housing has been missing for so long, you know, there's probably gonna be some pretty different duplex designs that come to market um, rather than you know, this uh, classic 1903 example. Next. Um, you know, we certainly see communities um, and builders prioritizing duplexes on corner lots really allows some great opportunities for um, separate facades and driveway access. Go ahead. Um, and then here's that detached duplex option that I was mentioning, um, how in this particular site they were able to put in two smaller units um, on a lot that otherwise would have a single family detached dwelling. Go ahead. Um, We'll be looking at the parking impacts. Here's one way that um, you know the units can be joined with the driveway and the garages um, as a common wall. Go ahead. Uh, and another similar approach here where the shared driveway. Um, next housing type we wanna talk about is the cottage cluster. Um, and so this is a type that um, is multiple small units um, generally five or five or more or, or four to 12 is here what we've got um, that are allowed we're going to look to allow those in all the residential zones on lots that are 7,000 square feet or larger um, and each of these units um, is going to be restricted to a footprint of 900 square feet uh, that comes directly from the state legislation so we can't change that footprint um, but there is flexibility if the city wants to allow a single story or two story um, for these cottage clusters so you can go up to a maximum of 1800 square feet in building area um, for each of these and then the key feature is not only are these smaller but they're going to be clustered around a common courtyard um, and the at least or up to 50 percent of the units need to face onto that common green space um, and we're looking at you know a requirement for 150 square feet of open space um, per unit uh, to create that central green space and just like these other types, we're looking at one off-street parking space. And something that's a little unique about cottage clusters is they could either be um, like a shared parking lot clustered in one part of the site, or they could be individual garages with each cottage. So let's look at a couple pictures to give you a better idea what we're talking about. Um, so first of all, the individual cottages, we're looking at these smaller scale one to two story dwellings. Go ahead. Um, another example. And you're starting to see already from those pictures how they're clustered around a common green space. Um, this is an example built recently in Silverton, Oregon, where we're also doing some code update work. Um, with cottages, you can see in the upper right hand corner how they've dealt with parking. There is a, a shared garage as well as shared surface parking spaces there. Go ahead. Uh, another layout, this one's from the city of Florence a project that's been built there. Pretty traditional layout here for cottages where you've got um, a looped parking lot driveway um, and then the units themselves are clustered around the lawn and common garden. 
Go ahead. Um, and maybe another way to think about it, um, another layout that we've seen more of a loop with the parking that brings the parking into the interior of the site and allows a little more convenient access um, for each of the cottages to the parking um, that then has some impacts on where that common open space gets located. So some of the units um, are more directly opening onto the common open space and others you know, have a slightly different orientation. So there's some trade-offs here um, when we think about how the units are oriented. Next, let's, oh, no, you're great. Let's talk about townhouses. Um, so Grants Pass already has some townhouses um, and what we're looking to do is expand those so that townhouses um, will be permitted on in all residential zones with a minimum lot size of 1500 square feet, uh, which is pretty, which is significantly smaller than the current lot sizes, um, but creates some parity with the other housing types that we're talking about um, tonight. Um, also to go with that, um, reducing the minimum lot width to 20 feet, but otherwise um, holding to the same height setback and lot coverage standards as single family detached dwellings. There are some opportunities um, to apply some, you know, clear and objective, that's a, a state term, um, design standards. And, and the clear and objective just means that it, it's measurable and it's, it's, it's a yes or a no answer. They're not discretionary in terms of, you know, the unit looks nice or it looks compatible. It's just a question of, you know, do you meet, um, we'll see um, what some of these look like, but the entryway, is your entryway oriented towards, um, towards the sidewalk and creates a welcoming entry? Um, is does the window coverage, you know, is a certain percentage of window coverage on your front facade? And then where are the garage and driveways located relative to the house? So those are aspects of townhouse design that can be covered um, by the new code. Um, and then same, we're looking at the one off street parking space. So here's a couple, you know, examples of recently constructed townhouses around the state, um, different ways that they can be oriented um, to meet some of these requirements. Go ahead. Um, you know, here's an example of one where you've got pretty similar architectural detailing. Go ahead. Um, and then there are some opportunities to, to require some differentiation. Um, you've got similar massing here, but there's at least a few changes in the um, window alignment and, and color, paint colors at least. Um, also opportunities to get those garages and the driveways off of the front facade um, and get the parking in the rear of the site. Go ahead. Um, another opportunity to bring those entrances forward and emphasize the front facade with parking access from the back. Go ahead. Uh, I think this is our last example, but just you know, again, a, a variety of townhouse products that we're seeing. Go ahead. Um, and then our last housing type to discuss tonight is the triplex and quadplex. So um, what we need to do in the Grants Pass Code is right now these are regulated under the same set of requirements as apartments. And so you can imagine that a lot of the design standards and site layout concepts, you know, for a 20 or 50 unit complex really just don't work for triplexes and quadplexes. So we're going to pull these out um, from the, that set of regulations and instead we're going to permit them in all the residential zones on essentially the same size lots as single family detached dwellings. There are some, some minimums, right? And so if the if the lot size is lower in the underlying zone, you can you can keep the minimum at 5,000 square feet um, for triplex or 7,000 for quadplex. But um, you know, otherwise we essentially want to treat them pretty similar to single family detached dwellings, same building envelope in terms of the lot coverage, the height and the setbacks. Um, and then again, we have an opportunity for some clear and objective design standards to address how the entryways are relate to the street, um, some minimum window coverage, and then the garage and driveway piece again. And then that same one off street parking space per unit. Go ahead. Um, so some pictures of recent um, triplex construction to sort of think through what these could look like. Um, this example from the coast up in the Newport area. Uh, this is from Dallas, Oregon. Um, I'm assured this is a triplex, even though we can only see the two units on the street, but that just points to how there could be some different configurations. And here's more of a side-by-side -side quadplex example um, where each unit um, is facing the street. It's pretty similar to how a townhouse project could look, except that it's common ownership. Uh, and here's a, a new development um, also from the metro area, but this is what they're, they're planning to build for, for a new quadplex. 
Um, so it looks like we've got about 10 minutes um, left and opportunities for your questions and clarifications um, about the residential uses we've talked about, where they might go, the scale of units and buildings, um, if you have discussions particular, you know, if you want to talk about parking or any other aspect. Um, and I'll also put a plug in here to say that um, we wanted to focus this meeting on providing more, you know, the visuals and the background information. Um, and we do have a survey available online that is that is live and is specifically calibrated to get your input on these pieces about the middle housing code and priorities um, in writing that code. So um, turn it over to Steve to help us facilitate this portion um, as we wrap up our discussion tonight. And thank you for your patience um, and just sticking with all these different facets of housing. It's been great to be here. Thank you, Elizabeth. <clears throat> Brad, um, why don't you go ahead and see if there's anyone in the room who has a question or comment. At the same time, if you are on a computer, please raise your hand like we've done before. And then in about five minutes, we'll see if anyone on the phone has a question or comment. So Brad, anyone in the room? We have whittled it down to four <laughs> in the room. <laughs> it's getting late. It's getting late. Zoning code. So, uh, uh, and Elizabeth, I, I don't take that personally. It was uh, whittling before. So, <laughs> um, anyone questions or comments on this? Okay. So it looks like we're good in the room, Steve. Okay. I'm not seeing any hands raised uh, from people on computers. I'll ask if anyone uh, on their phone would like to ask a question or make a comment. Go ahead and push star six to unmute yourself and um, <clears throat> go ahead and speak. Um, at the same time, if you are on your computer, you can still let me know. Um, I've got a, we'll see if there's anyone from the phone. I've got a comment here. Um, I would like to get some general and or specific information on density bonuses as a possible incentive. Moreover, would density bonuses help the city align with House Bill for, uh, I'm not sure if it says 4001, so I'm not sure if it's 2001 or 4006, but um, Brad or Elizabeth, 2001. So 2001. I'll direct that to Elizabeth. <laughs> yeah, no, I'd be happy to talk about that. So first of all, I think density bonuses were being discussed earlier more in the context of um, multi-unit apartment style housing. Um, and, you know, there's some economics that underlie that. I'll leave that for someone else. But specifically to how density bonuses tie into HB 2001 um, is that, you know, in some ways, all of these middle housing types are effectively a density bonus, right? Because they're allowing more units on a lot that would otherwise be used for a single family detached home. You know, you could think of allowing duplexes on that same size lot as, you know, you've just given someone a hundred percent density bonus to put a duplex in. Um, but at the same time, I'd say, we're not necessarily pitching it as a density bonus because it's more about getting the unit types in and that when you get down to just that individual lot level you know the the density of a given lot sort of becomes a less meaningful metric for measuring it um but yes effectively by allowing more units on the same size lots you are increasing the density um you know and if you like to think of that as a bonus um then it is and what about minimum density standards? Mm, well, um, so minimum density standards in Grants Pass is, um, you know, I understand has been a topic of conversation for a long time. Um, and there are some opportunities written into the code right now um, where the city, the city does not currently apply minimum density in any zones. Um, but it has the option to enact that portion of the code by, by changing um, some of the, the zoning designations. Um, and so effectively, it's a tool that the city could use going forward. And I would say that generally um, allowing more middle housing will make it easier to meet minimum density standards um, as, we, as the city looks to do that. You know, just because the duplexes and the quadplexes, the townhouses on 1,500 square foot lots you know, a 1500 square foot lot gets you to 25 to 29 units per acre, which can be pretty comparable to some, um, you know, lower density middle, um, what am I trying to say, multifamily housing. Um, so middle housing can be a real benefit um, to get to there, but there would also need to be, you know, 
a shift separate from this project to enact minimum density standards in some or all of the residential zones. So I'd like to add a little bit. This is Doug Walker again. Um, the Housing Advisory Committee is currently discussing minimum densities and how to move that idea with details to City Council. Um, currently, it looks like the Housing Advisory Committee is going to recommend we we um, we're is going to recommend to Council that we adopt some type of minimum densities with R three, R four, R five lots. We have to work out details and try to figure out exactly how that gets applied. But it is a notion that we're working through. Um, it is a really large problem in grants past that past developments, our history in the past has been very uh, minimal density or not very dense developments. And so we have um, quite a bit of spread within the old town and, and some of the subdivisions. And, and we see that um, as a possibility to both increase the efficiency of services that the city apply, um, provides and for increasing just more units out there for renters as well. Great. This is Valerie Lovelace and I'm a city councilor and trust me, we're doing everything and we can and we do appreciate Doug Walker coming on board to, you know, and trying to move forward. But I will tell you um, the, the, the backlash that we get, I think in rural communities when you're taught is parking. That's been our biggest battle all along is the change in parking spaces and you, you know, they all look good and look great, but when it comes down to having a massive amount of cars, because how many people, I mean, you put two people in a house and oftentimes both people are drivers. So you have two cars. And so then they have kids and they become teenagers and then they want parking spaces. I mean, and it's just, it's kind of, that's what we run up against. So mm -hmm. we have had several um, of these projects come down and we have, you know, whole neighborhoods come up in you know mad because they don't like the idea of the parking and so that's one of the biggest things that we fight is that parking issue because we don't have this type of transit that you have in larger cities so how are you seeing that addressed in other rural areas and small town or smaller towns you know that don't have the mass transit opportunities that you see up in the up in the metro areas yeah, well, thank you for that, Valerie. And, you know, we certainly appreciate the, you know, the struggles that communities are seeing um, around parking and, you know, absolutely would acknowledge that transportation needs are different um, in different communities um, based on what the options are. Um, I think that, you know, I don't think that anyone is much ahead of you to say, <laughs> in the sense that, you know, the HB 2001, the way that it's been implemented um, through the rulemaking process, it changes the rules across the state for communities in making, you know, setting that minimum requirement at one space per unit for these new housing types. And, you know, that, you know, I've heard it said by state planners that, you know, they took the hit so that local city councils don't have to, um, that um, in terms of getting that pushback and getting those complaints. And so the idea being that by setting it at the state level, there doesn't have to be a fight um, on each project or on, in each community over these rules. Um, now, how that actually plays out, you know, I, I wanna acknowledge we don't, you know, we don't know. I don't know if, if consultants are supposed to say that, but um, I think that it's definitely gonna be an evolving area that we need to watch um, and see how it works in different communities and see, you know, does this make sense as a statewide standard? Does it make sense in Grants Pass? What are some other tools that the city might consider using, you know, if they're seeing real impacts on on-street parking? Is it changing the right-of-way configurations and changing how much on-street parking is available? Is it changing, you know, how cities, um, you know, manage and regulate that on-street parking? Um, are there any other tools? Um, we've also been encouraged to be in contact with the uh, Josephine County Transit. Um, so we will be talking with them to see if there's anything we can do to, you know, align with um, some of their long range planning or, or, you know, transit strategies about housing, how housing could better support transit lines. Um, yes, I, I think Grants Pass will be in good company of figuring out how to, how to manage this going forward. Yeah, I think the conversation really needs to be had between the housing department and the transportation 
because I, if you could get transportation that's consistent, mm -hmm. um, then people will use it. But we don't have the money to put something in that's consistent. And so it's just the same old you know, thing back and forth. So I think that if you were to work more hand in hand up there with your ODOT and the Salem, because I know there's a lot going on in there, but you're a lot closer than we are and try to mm -hmm. make those two to mesh. I think you go a long way in helping rural communities to build the consistency in with the transit. Because right now our transmit, transit works, I think Monday, Friday, you know, from such and such, you know, there's only limited hours and they're doing everything they can, trust me, because I am on the transit committees and I'm working with them as hard as I can, but there's limited funding and it will not happen until there's consistency and adequate time because people work all hours of the day. Not everybody works eight to five. And so a mm -hmm. lot of these people, they want the safety. They're afraid to, um, you know, walk alone at night. So there's just a lot of those things that have to be factored in. And so that would be my message to you is to help out by by helping to get the funding going for the transit in rural communities um, to help us get to that spot. Thank you, Councillor. I don't know how much uh, pull we have in Salem, but we can certainly pass those along to um, DLCD, who's, who's helping fund this project and our work for you. And and the others who we come in contact with, um, <clears throat> a little bit tricky here at the end. Brad, we broke your promise of of ending at eight. Thank you. I was going to ask you to switch to the last slide. Um, there is a li the link there to the middle housing survey. And before we're done, um, there's a couple of comments. Uh, it looks like Susan just lowered her hand. I'm just going to read these comments really quickly. Um, it looks like um, Anita asked for a little more information on what minimum density standards means and and the okay Susan I'll get to you in just one second um, and if it if that isn't problematic for more affordable housing and I don't know um, Elizabeth maybe you can give just a brief answer to to that yeah minimum density essentially says um, that you need to have um, that you have to make sure that you accommodate a certain number of units um, on a given site and so say you know, generally it's a range. You've got a minimum of 10 units per acre or up to a maximum of 14 units per acre. And the idea is just to use the land efficiently, that if you've set aside land where you can build up to 14 units per acre, but somebody comes in and just builds, you know, four homes there on really large lots, that there's sort of a, a wasted potential there. Um, and that if you want to build low density, you should go off to the low density zone. Um, and you should, uh, so it's particularly protecting, um, you know, medium and higher density zones to make sure that they produce alternatives to single family housing. Um, and so it generally is not problematic for affordable housing. If anything, it sort of protects that land supply and makes sure that more units get built um, to increase the supply. Most affordable Thanks. housing is more concerned about maximum density than minimum. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, we're going to go to Susan, and then there's one more question in the comments, and then we're going to wrap it up. So, Susan, uh, quick question or comment? Well, it's it's a comment and a question, um, and I didn't hear anything about the impact of the fires on mm -hmm. the density conversation. I recently attended an Oregon Economic Summit put on by you know the OAR, uh, Oregon Association of Realtors or national economists, state economists, and state legislature, where they were discussing actually moving away from this maximum density model due to the impact of the fires, um, say, in the talent area and so forth. And while we need more density in our area, um, I'm just wondering if any of that um, working on information, which is at least a year old, um, was taken into consideration or when the Housing Advisory Committee dug plans on, you know, promoting more density, encouraging the city to do so. And of course, Valerie commented on that. But it was that fire situation and the density, which led to even more devastation. Was that looked at in your consideration of this? Is that accounted for? Thank you. Yeah, no, thanks for that. And gosh, you know, I actually work in talent also. And so it was just heartbreaking to see those fires. Um, 
I think there's so many different ways that housing planning can address wildfire risk. Um, so I would say it's not explicitly part of this project. Uh, you know, generally, I would say if you can get more units in less land area rather than continuing to sprawl into areas that are you know more prone to wildfire, you're probably going to you know reduce the the risks. Um, but we certainly want to make sure that any housing that's built is built to fire code. Um, well, of course, all of these housing has to meet all the fire code for sprinklers and for access, um, you know, all those pieces. So um, it's not an explicit tie, but uh, we will be looking at uh, what we can do. And I think one thing that has been interesting about HB 2001 and the way that this happened um, is thinking about, you know, are there going to be areas that are considered, you know, wildfire hazard areas, say, um, where these middle housing types are not permitted um, or promoted just because of some of those issues. So um, but that's more of a, an evolving issue. Thanks, Elizabeth. Last question. Um, <clears throat> um, is the current uh, dem I guess demo huh? Go I ahead. think it's the current demographic trend. Demographic trend, yeah, of owner occupied units. Will that shift to renter occupied in housing projections? And that seems like a Tim question. Yeah, it is, and um, they they will slightly. We just expect a, a, a slight uptick in in renter occupied versus owner occupied. Thanks, Tim. Uh, thanks, everyone. I'm going to hand it back to Brad, but please go ahead and um, take the uh, middle housing survey. We'd appreciate hearing your comments there and um, anything re related, um, you know, to this meeting. Anything we've covered at this meeting, you also can. Uh, send an email to Brad and Brad, maybe you can provide your email address, which also is in that survey um, and on the on the city's website, but we'll hand it over to Brad to, to close. Thanks very much, Steve, Elizabeth, Tim, um, Jason, and more importantly, everybody. Well, not more importantly, but uh, the people who aren't being paid to come here tonight. <laughs> Um, really appreciate it. We are going to put this recording on the website. We will make sure that this survey gets out um, to as many folks as possible using our various realtor associations and property management groups and try to really get this more broadly than just sort of our traditional group of about, you know, 20 people that follow city business. So that's uh, going to be an objective of ours with this particular survey. Um, but uh, yeah, I think we're going to call it a wrap and uh, really appreciate it. So good night. Thank you so much. Mm. Yep. Mm.